Jazzcast Pros. When it comes to the the individual, the individual is going to function the way that they function. And so to know that there's these different sleep types or awake types is really very interesting. With being in the mental health space, you know, it goes into an individual's core belief system, the environment in which they are raised, like, you know, with sleep prioritizing your home, like there's so many different variables. So to provide generalizations, it's no wonder that the sleep epidemic has become larger because people are very confused and they don't know how to fix what's broken. And we're, you know, heading to the internet and just applying what makes sense. (laughs) There are experts for this, guys, and one of them is soda. And it is difficult to be healthy without having a healthy sleep life. Welcome to Living the Front Seat Life. I'm your host, Kelly Marie, and I invite you to take this journey with me. We're going to be talking about all things mental health and emotional well-being. You see, I am a overcomer. If you are interested in figuring out the path for you to determine how and where you will drive your future, this is the place to be. We get to determine the ride. We may not get to determine the weather or who's on the road with us or if it's going to be a scenic route or not, but we are the drivers. So join me on this ride living the front seat life. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Living the Front Seat Life. I am your host, Kelly Marie, and we are talking about sleep. Last week, we had a phenomenal conversation um, around sleep, what it is, why it works the way it does, and where we're going wrong. So this week, we're bringing back sleep expert Soda Kuchkowski, and we are diving into solutions. Soda, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. No problem. So last week, we talked about why sleep was important and all of the things that we're probably doing wrong. So can you just bring us up to speed? Just a quick recap on what good sleep is and why it's so important. Well, first, I want to just kind of mention, you know, when it comes to our sleep, that's one of the things that I talk about people, talk with people initially is really their mindset about sleep. We kind of have these uh, misconceptions about it, or we kind of have these limiting beliefs. And then, you know, exactly what you said, people think, oh, well, you know, I'm doing everything wrong when it comes to my health care. And I had mentioned that everything that I do is about empowering individuals. So it's all about taking those little things that we know and kind of tweaking them in the right way for our individual needs. And I think that's why it's so important. We had started to talk about uh, hydration, right? And our body is 75% water. Our our brain is 75% water. Our body is 60%. And when it comes to to sleep, sleep is a very dehydrating event, right? So making sure that we're drinking enough water is really important for a number of reasons I had mentioned about sluggishness and and so forth. But just thinking in terms of those those kind of little things that we do throughout the day, like we might not be great about hydration, but what are the habits that we can put in place? Like I had purchased, you know, a water bottle that has little marks on it so that if I haven't reached my quota for drinking water for the day, I know that I have to like kind of down the the water at that moment kind of catch up. So kind of putting little things in place to kind of help us remember with hydration. I tell people pour a glass of water right before bed. And then the very first thing you do when you wake up is drink a cup of room temperature water because sleep is so dehydrating. We lose about a liter of humidity through our breath when we sleep at night. And if you tend to be a hot sleeper, you also perspire it, right? We're sweating it out during. So drinking water first thing is really important. You are all up in my business, Soda. I am a sweater. (laughs) I sleep hot. I do try and have a glass of water first thing in the morning. And it wasn't for that reason, but I figured, you know, I'm not going to get it throughout the day the way I really want to. So let me start the day with a glass of water. At least that's one down. And I can end the day knowing that I got at least one glass in. Like in my mind, I get more water than I actually do. But in practice, I'm not good at it at all. 
And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's based on Ayurveda. Like people say, oh, why not cold water? So cold water shocks our system. Mm -hmm. We want it to be that room temperature water is really important. It's the same way when you're eating meals, it should always be room temperature water. You can drink ice cold water when you're working out and different things throughout the day. But when it comes to waking up in the morning and our meals, we shouldn't be drinking ice cold water. Good to know. You guys, I hope you're taking these nuggets and writing them down. You can always come back and listen, but this is great. Now, soda what should, because we, we talked about all the things, you know, that I'm probably personally doing wrong. In addition to water, you started to talk about melatonin and how the body produces it automatically, but we take supplements. What are some ways that we can help our body increase melatonin and are the supplements really beneficial? So when it comes to melatonin, like I mentioned, our body produces it naturally. Taking in light first thing in the morning is going to help us with that. Taking in again between that 12 noon to 2 p.m. If you're someone who tends to be like an early riser and you're up before the sun rises, look at investing in a light therapy lamp, at least 10,000 lux, because we need that blue light first thing in the morning to set that circadian rhythm in motion. So that's going to be the first thing. And then limiting that artificial light at night. One thing to note is as we get older, Older, our body produces less melatonin. So the older that you get, and we're actually seeing it even as early as individuals in their 30s, because we do things to either strengthen or disrupt that 24 hour clock in which we operate. And one of those things is we're constantly cutting off our melatonin faucet and our ability to produce the hormone because of all of the, the lights that we're inundated with. Because it used to be that we were by candlelight, right? But now it's like every light in the room you know, in the house on, right. we're looking at our phones, we're looking at TVs, we're looking at tablets, computers, and that proximity to your face is also, you know, something that can be very inhibiting. And it's constantly sending cues and signals to our brain that it's time to be awake. But when it comes to dosing with melatonin, less is more. That's where we kind of see the first kind of negative things when people go to buy it over the counter, they sell it in 10, 20, 30. I even saw an advertisement on Facebook for like 600 milligrams, which is entirely way too much. In clinical studies, we're only using it at three and 10 milligram doses in, in certain populations. You know, shift workers, people who travel across different time zones. We have young adolescents in maybe in the ADHD population. You know, it's very, it's based on an individual case. If you're taking too much of it, it can interfere with diabetic medication medication, um, seizure medication. It can even uh, interfere with birth control. So it's really important to understand that when you take too much of it, what you're doing is you're actually causing yourself to have what's called circadian misalignment. You're constantly moving and shifting. And a lot of times too, people will take it right before bed. They're like, oh, I can't sleep. Let me take a melatonin right before I go to sleep. Or, oh, I wake up in the middle of the night. Let me take a melatonin. And really you should be taking it about 90 minutes to two hours before you go to bed. So beyond like light regulation, there's natural sources that we can get it from. One of them being Mount Morency cherry tart juice. So they're the cherries that you make a pie with. Uh, so if you drink just two ounces of this and you want to make sure it doesn't have apple juice or sugar in it, you want it to be all natural. In clinical studies, it showed two, drinking two ounces of it before bed help you sleep 84 minutes longer, where melatonin supplements only help you sleep 17 minutes longer. And there are other sources, you know, tomatoes, walnuts, cedarwood, essential oil helps to stimulate the pineal gland, which uh, releases melatonin as well. So there's other natural things that you can do to boost it. I feel like you're upstairs in the house somewhere looking at the bottle of melatonin by the bed. <laughs> <laughs> because these are and that's, you know and, and not all melatonin is because i don't want people to think melatonin isn't you know the end all bad thing when it comes to sleep it's just very misused and misunderstood mm -hmm. melatonin helps to support our health in a number of different ways if you have someone who is a cancer survivor they have less melatonin uh, cardiovascular health there's other ways melatonin can support our system mm -hmm. but you should only be taking it under the care of a healthcare professional selling it over the counter there was a study another study that was done that showed that 71% of the supplements sold on the market have more ingredients in them that is actually marked on the package. So like they're putting valerian root with melatonin and all these things that cause you to be groggy, which you don't want people getting behind the wheel of a car because then you're impaired, right? right? And that can cause other issues, traffic fatalities. So it's really important to understand like it isn't without side effects. That's huge. Moderation is key. Always in consultation Moderation, with your getting it from natural sources. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna go grab some tart cherry tart cherry juice. 
Say that five times. Yeah, and it fast. has to be Mount. It has to be Mount Morency. So it has to be that specific type. Oh, of, okay. Of, uh, cherry. As I am. So there's many taking different notes. types of cherry. Okay. Now with that, because we talked about diet, and you mentioned apple juice um, and, and other sweeteners. How long before bed should we not be eating or drinking? sodas, juice, coffee, etc. Well, you don't want to drink too much water because then you don't want to be running to the bathroom. But the general rule is two to three hours before bed. You know, it's again, based on Ayurveda, our body is very much at work when we're sleeping. Our digestive system is very much at work. Our brain is very active while we're sleeping. There's a lot of things that are going on. Uh, you know, it's going to be again on an individual basis. There are some snacks that are considered like bedtime snacks that can help you, but it's also based on an individual's medical history or their nutrition, nutritional needs. Like, so like wheat crackers could be a bedtime snack, but if you're someone who has a gluten intolerance, not a good snack for you, right? right? Those cherries is good. A handful of almonds or walnuts is another good kind of like bedtime snack. Um, Greek yogurt, but if you're lactose intolerant, again, you know, not a good thing. There's some individuals where eating like spicy foods can aggravate like their acid reflux and cause issues with like gut, right? Or issues with like their esophagus. But, you know, there's other individuals who can eat that and it doesn't make a difference at all. Generally, we don't want a larger meal any sooner than two to three hours before bed. When it comes to alcohol, you know, when people have sleep challenges, they'll often turn to alcohol as a sedative because it helps you fall asleep, but it causes fragmented sleep. It can lead to a lot of like snoring, um, excessive snoring. The general rule is for every glass of wine, liquor, you know, uh, beer, you should have one glass of water to offset that. And again, we should we want to cut that out at least two or three hours before we're going to bed as well. So talking about healthy habits and healthy sleep habits, I've been reading about sleep routines and, you know, having a routine in place so that the body gets used to, you know, this this process of going to sleep, which is something that we talk about generally setting routines for your day because it helps the brain to, you know, self-regulate and, and, it, and there is a sense of normalcy when you have this routine in place. Are sleep routines a thing? Is this just something that I read about in the magazine that really doesn't have the science to back it? Is this something that folks should be doing? Well, you know, I kind of have, because I've been doing this for 16 years, when it comes to our sleep, like I tell everyone, you should have different bedtime routines. Like obviously, like, you know, knowing that you're going to wash your face and different things and kind of setting the pattern based on like your individual, like for instance, I had said that light is, a, you know, sending cues to our brain right before we're going to go to bed. It might be better to take off your makeup hours before uh, you're going to bed, like right when you come home. So that way you're not inundating yourself with that right before bed. So when it comes to bedtime routines, I tell people it's really based on what's going on in your life. You know, you and I had mentioned about anxiety and stress. There's this vicious cycle with sleep. And depending on your self-care needs is what you need to implement at the time. I can't tell you over the years, I've worked with so many different clients and there's so many recommendations out there. Like, you know, everyone thinks that whatever worked for their neighbor or their friend or their coworker is going to work for them. You know, there's this obsession with lavender and sleep and, you know, Lavender has been this, the flower of the, or, or, you know, essential oil that has been studied the most. It shows that it calms our brain waves. It helps to regulate skin temperature and it does have some benefits, right? And it's going to be subjective based on the individual, but it's not the end all for sleep. And a lot of... If you've been thinking about starting a podcast and you want to include interviews with people across town, Riverside.fm offers unbelievable high quality recordings, regardless of your or your guest internet quality. And it also gives you separate audio and video tracks for each person speaking. And unlike Zoom, you don't have to install anything on your computer and your guests don't either. Head over to Riverside.fm and use promo code JazzyCast to get 60 free minutes of recording and 15% off a membership plan. Times too, a lot of these products have synthetic uh, fragrances, so it's not actual lavender. And when we're drink- when we're smelling those types of toxins and chemicals, that can also impair our central nervous system and lead to uh, breathing disorder known as sleep apnea. So there's a correlation with the air quality in our home as well. I mean, I have individuals who are like, you know, I took a bath. I'm drinking tea and like they don't even enjoy the activity that they're doing. They're trying to force relaxation upon themselves and forcing it never works. That's why we have such an issue with insomnia is because we're trying to force something that should come naturally. And and with intention, right? There's a difference between that forcing it and just being mindful about what we're doing, how we're doing it, you know, mentioning taking off the makeup when you get home. That is something that's never crossed my mind. You know, I'm not going anywhere once I get here. 
So why not take it off earlier in the day? If, if you're in a very stressful state, I mean, the last two years have been very challenging for a lot of people figuring out like, how was your day? You know, do you need to read a book? Do you benefit from taking a bath, but do you enjoy it? You know what I mean? Like when it comes to consistency with a bed and a wake time, waking up is always more important. Waking up consistently is always more important than the time you go to bed. Most often people will miss their bedtime anywhere from a half hour to an hour and a half. But if we're waking up at the same time every single day, that's letting our body know when we're tired, it helps to promote your sleep drive. So waking up at the same time every day is more important than the time that you go to sleep. Good to know. So I've, um, you know, do a lot of reading, trying to figure out what information is good and not necessarily good. And there are tons of, of discussions going on about teas, which tea to drink at night. Is there truth in you know, teas and sleep time. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we, you want to stay away from any type of, you know, caffeinated. So herbal teas is going to be better. Um, you know, people don't often realize that things, you know, if they're drinking black tea or Earl Grey, that that has caffeine that can interfere with their sleep. Everyone has a different, different sensitivity to caffeine. So that's one of those other recommendations where like for an individual such as myself, I can have a cup of coffee and go to sleep, but I know because of the, the field that I work in that that reduces my deep sleep. So that's the physical, the stage responsible for physical recovery, that reduces it by 20%. So that's why like sports teams and so forth are paying attention to these like lifestyle factors because having, you know, whether it be coffee or, you know, energy drinks, or you can get it from chocolate, it's, you know, caffeine is in some medications that can hinder your ability to sleep deeply. And we need that deep sleep for that physical and that mental restoration. So it's just about understanding, you know, when it comes to teas, there's like chamomile, there's a lot of different ones that you can, you know, valerian root tends to be a stronger one that um, the one I recommend for like my shift workers, because it's a stronger blend that can help you sleep deeper, especially on your days off. Mm -hmm. But then there's other recommendations like things like kava kava. If you're someone who's recovering from drug or alcohol use, that's not an appropriate herb to have in your tea because that can cause you to relapse. So understanding that herbal supplements are the are the foundation for medication. So that's why they say, you know, make sure you speak with your healthcare professional because they aren't without risks. It all depends on your medical history, what's appropriate for you. And you also want something that's going to be natural versus, you know, tea bags that have chemicals or, or filtered in a certain way that could be adding toxins to your system. Right. So if people want to get more information, how can they contact you? How can they learn more about you and Start With Sleep? Well, my, my website, www.startwithsleep.com uh, is going to be the best way. I have a, you, there's a link on there for uh, my YouTube channel. I have a blog section. So I, you know, everything from what are the 13 best sleep promoting plants and how do you incorporate and how do you care for them? What are the health benefits, you know, incorporating sleep or plants into the bedroom for sleep or into your home for health in general, for improving like air quality. So I have a number of different resources. Um, they're able to book services and also take a look at all of the different curated sleep tools um, that I've put together as well. And start with sleep.com. I'm a major plant mom. And so you mentioned house plant. I, when we finish this, am heading over to the website to see if I need to rearrange my plants or, you know, I love buying plants, buy some more to offset my current collection. So that is great to know. Again, something that, you know, how would we know, you know, that there are plants that help promote sleep that do better in the bedroom than in the living room or really change the air quality? Unless that's what you're specifically looking for. I buy them because they're cute and they just speak to me. Yeah. Well, it's, it's great that there's a like a plant rage because, you know, the air inside of our home is 10 times more polluted and toxic than the outside air. Wow. Uh, you know, especially over this last year, we don't, we often don't open our windows to, you know, air everything out, our furniture, you know, everything from our couch to our rug, to our, our mattress, all of these things are constantly emitting toxins and chemicals that we can't see. If we're working from home, if you're using a printer, if you're using a gas stove and you're not using, you know, the ventilation or the vent, if you're taking a shower and you're not turning on the fan, like there's a number of things that can uh, compromise the air quality inside of our homes. And we don't, we don't realize that we're constantly breathing these different things that compromises our breathing patterns, which in turn can affect our sleep. What about exercise? You mentioned being at home and a lot of folks really, truly are living a sedentary lifestyle because everyone is, is still at home. Yoga, stretching, you know, cardio, bike riding. Is there 
something that is more beneficial to do in the evening hours versus, say, starting your day with a, a routine or exercise routine? So, you know, when I work with clients, we we all have what's known as a chronotype. So I had mentioned like a chronotype is what people traditionally think of as like an early riser or a night owl. And based on your chronotype or your circadian rhythm is what it is, your own biological clock is actually the best time for you to work out. And what we find is that, you know, we operate on a 24 hour clock and there are a number of physiological processes that are happening. And depending on when we move, it's, if it's better for us to move for 10 or 15 minutes in the morning and work out for an hour in the evening, based on following those particular rhythms, we're going to see our ability to manage and our hormones and balance them better because a lot of times, especially for women, the reason we gain weight, we have hormonal imbalances and fluctuations and so forth. So understanding when is the best time to exercise. And it's really about these short kind of bouts. They say now like working out for hours on end is actually not beneficial. It's more about making sure that you're moving parts of your body, especially you said, you know, we're, we're sitting all the time. One of the things that yoga is great for is not only breath work and elongating our neck and our spine, but moving parts of our body that we traditionally don't think of like our fingers, our wrists, our ankles, things that tend to become inflamed as we get older because we're not moving them as much as we should. So what time of day should a night owl be working out and what time of day should a uh, early riser, early bird be working out? There's different kind of times that they should be working out in terms of like yoga and different things like that. But when it comes to like your particular chronotype, like for me, I'm, I'm what's known as a bear chronotype. We follow like the traditional rise and fall of the sun, right? We're the reason why there's like an eight to four or five work schedule. We have dinner at six or seven. We go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. My best time to actually work out is between six and 7 PM. Now I used to think that was crazy because I'm like, oh, we're going to work out first thing in the morning and get it out of the way. Right. But if I actually work out in the evening between that hour, I actually see the most benefits and the quickest impact with my physical recovery, my ability to lose weight by following my own biological clock, I see the best, the um, highest impact for what I'm trying to get done. So how many different types are there? There's four. So there was a sleep psychologist who kind of recoined them into this fun way to think about it. You can actually uh, figure out your chronotype. He has a website called thepowerofwhen.com. And he basically categorized them. They're the dolphin, the lion, the wolf, and the bear. So the bear is like that traditional why we have our schedule. The wolf is, you know, the night owl. Uh, the lion is that early riser. And then the dolphins tend to be like, it's about 10% of the population. Those are insomniacs who don't generally follow a schedule and they have a lot of sleep disruption. And they, like dolphins, they kind of sleep with half of their brain on. They're the ones who can't like turn it off. Okay. Wow. So can you give folks that website again? Uh, the power of And what's great about mm -hmm. learning like your chronotype is, you know, another recommendation is about like taking a hot shower before bed, mm -hmm. depending on your chronotype, you might benefit from a cold shower, a lukewarm, warm shower or hot bath. It depends wow. on the individual. So when we generalize, that's where people are like, oh, well, it didn't work. It didn't work. It just didn't work for you because you're not applying the science in the right way for your individual needs. Which is the same thing that we talk about when we talk about mental health and mental illness, you know, things pop up, you know, whether it's a, a short term condition or a, a long term illness, you know, things manifest differently for different people and it can have the exact same name. So it's interesting to hear that, you know, this too, like most things, you know, there we speak in generalities all the time, but when it comes to the, the individual, the individual is going to function the way that they function. And so to know that there's these different sleep types or awake types is really very interesting. Overcoming your challenges also, I mean, with being in the mental health space, you know, it goes into an individual's core belief system, the environment in which they are raised, like, right. you know, with sleep prioritizing your home, like there's so many different variables. So to provide generalizations, it's no wonder that the sleep epidemic has become larger because people People are very confused and they don't know how to fix what's broken. And we're, you know, heading to the internet and just applying Brilliant. what makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> there are experts for this, guys, and one of them is Soda. So I would love for you, if you are having issues sleeping, head over to her website, Start With Sleep. Dot com and get some more information, set up a, a consultation, head over to the store if you're in the Western New York area, because sleep is, is really integral and it is difficult to be healthy without having a healthy sleep life. 
Any closing thoughts you want the folks to know about? What I reiterated earlier is that if you're looking to reset your sleep, look at prioritizing your life around it. Like the way that we eat should be to promote a healthy sleep cycle. I know we didn't get that much into nutrition, but if you're looking for one simple fix, that light regulation alone is going to be the big thing. Get that morning light, get it again between 12 noon and 2 p.m., Start avoiding that artificial light at night, not looking at your phone, and you'd be surprised how much the quality of your sleep will improve, which in turn will help the quality of your energy during the days, and it makes a huge impact on your health. Well, and people, you know, will ask me how I have so much time to watch so many episodes of things on Netflix and, you know, Amazon Prime. It's because I'm watching them at night when I should be sleeping. So it is, again, going back to this sleep routine and what's important and not important. That's not as important as it is to get sleep. So just, I, I like the go slow and grow philosophy on making changes towards a healthy routine. So to thank you so very much for joining me and digging deep into this topic of sleep. I appreciate you so much. And until the next time, folks, I encourage you to be the light I want to make sure, you know, this is September and it is Suicide Awareness Month. So I want to leave you with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. It's 1-800-273-8255. 800-273-8255. Or you can text HOME to 741-741. Both resources are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can speak to a crisis counselor. If you're just looking for resources, you know, you know what you need, you just don't know where to get it, try dialing 211 on your phone or go to 211 in your browser and do a keyword search. So until the next time, I encourage you again, folks, to be the light. I am so thankful to Soda for everything that you do and all of the work you do here in Western New York. You are truly a gem. Thank you, folks. Take care.